Kia ora. Hello. The late medieval period was one of great turmoil, wars, famines, plagues, and revolutions. Recently, we looked at the Great European Famine. This week, we will continue our series on the crisis of the late Middle Ages and discuss some of the causes of the revolutions that swept medieval Europe and what the driving factors were. While most people are familiar with the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, the 14th and 15th centuries were rife with revolutions. This video won't be discussing all revolutions or rebellions for a couple of reasons. First, because there were a lot. There was around a thousand popular uprisings and movements that occurred between 1250 and 1425. And secondly, we intend to look at some important revolutions in separate videos later. As you know, YouTube is always hungry for that sweet, sweet content. Instead, what we will do is look at a few examples of some of the popular revolts of the period and discuss the overarching causes and how they fit into the context of the crisis of the late Middle Ages and the medieval cities. I'm Andrew, and this is Popular Urbanum, a show where we discuss reenactment and the medieval middle class. Popular revolts in the medieval period can be divided into two distinct phases. The first being agitations of the middle class and the guilds, the second being the so-called peasant revolts. But these were more than just peasant revolts. Usually, the participants came from many different social classes. More on that later. Both phases were a response to the rising social and economic inequities that were growing during the 12th and 13th centuries. That would inevitably come to a head during the 14th century. To understand this, let's have a brief discussion on the situation in Europe that led us to this unrest. The gap between rich and poor had been growing during the 13th century. The nobility and the patrician elite of the cities had locked out any social mobility for the rest of population. Wages were stagnating and poverty was at an all-time high. The late 13th century and 14th century saw an increase of wars, something which we will cover in later videos. As we know, wars are expensive. To pay for these, kings would debase their currencies, which would cause inflation. Alternatively, they could go into massive debt with lenders at massive interest rates. This often was paid by enacting strict taxes at home to avoid personal bankruptcies. This would put even more pressure on the poor. The property elites who relied on rents to maintain their lands and lifestyle were also suffering due to these rising costs. However, they would raise their rents. If this failed, they cheated, stole, used their feudal rights to extract whatever they could from the suffering poor. During this time, Europe was also going through a millennial revolution. Many believed it was the end times. Preachers inflamed the poor with ideals of equality for all before God. The church was also facing difficult questions of ideology regarding wealth and inequality, primarily headed by the Franciscan movement. We also see proto-Protestant thoughts about equality and the role of the church from the likes of John Ball, John Wycliffe, and later, Jeanne House. Finally, the Great Famine and the Black Death shook the foundations of society, disrupting the workforce and labour relations. This all led to the breaking of the economic deadlock the 13th century had imposed on society. While the Great Famine was responsible for impoverishing more people, the Black Death spread more wealth by inheritance. Additionally, workers had greater freedoms to negotiate wages as there was a worker shortage. Attempts by the property elites to maintain the status quo and keep wages low led to further agitations. Now we understand the overall causes, let's look at some of the finer details. Since these were not coherent rebellions or proletariat uprisings, often they were responding to their local conditions. As mentioned, there are two distinct phases of popular medieval revolution. The first is a primarily middle-class urban movement taking place in the first half of the 14th century. This is the political movement in search of more representation and upward mobility of the middle class. 
such as the Flemish Rebellion of 1338 and the Rebellions of Rome of 1347. In the second phase of the revolutions, they are directed by the poor. As we discussed in our videos of who the poor were, these are not just the infirm or out of work. These also consisted of the working poor. Although many of these movements also included people of all levels of society. The English Peasants Revolt of 1381 contained knights and merchants in its ranks. So too the French Tax Revolts of 1380, which included high-ranking merchants and city's officials. Many of the movements are centred around the medieval cities and the guilds. As we have discussed before, the guild masters locked out movement into the upper echelons of the guilds, or that the greater guilds denied the lesser guilds any political participation, such as the Chiompi uprising in Florence, where the least paid workers, the carders, dyers and doublet makers, tried to gain more pay and rights, which spiralled into a revolt, which they established their own guilds and government. Now, let's look at two separate early revolts and compare them. First, let's consider the Peasant Revolt of Flanders in 1323. And it lasted until 1328. The revolts began as tax riots and anti-French sentiment, as the new Count Louis of Navarre was aligned with the French. As the Count now had these sentiments, factions who were once in exile for their pro-French alliance returned to Flanders and took office, soon to extract vengeance on those who they saw responsible for their exile. Harsh taxation, corruption and unfair treatment was common. Additionally, the Flemish cities were reliant on the English wool for their trade. Any disruption to this would be devastating to their economy. Once started, the riots erupted into full-scale revolution, led by Nicolas Zenekin, a wealthy farmer who built a coalition with urban leaders and rural captains who attacked magistrates and officials who had returned from exile. The rebels were able to capture the Count of Flanders and several cities. The rebellion redistributed land and provided relief to the poor. It was only through the intervention of the French and the death of Zanakin that the rebellion was put down. However, this readied the Flemish for further political revolutions. Next, let's look at the Paris Rebellion of 1358, which is wholly different. Often connected with the Jacquerie, this saw the government of Paris being seized by Etienne Marcel. This was an attempt to secure Paris and to stabilise the government since King Jean was being held captive in England and the English were demanding an exorbitant ransom for his return. The natural response was to debase the coin, which led to its devaluation. This caused Etienne to lead a general strike and to call to arms in January 1357. Etienne was far from a revolutionary, however. He was a provost of the merchants and head of the Paris militia. In February, he led several thousands into the palace where he confronted the Dauphin, who fled. Etienne attempted to establish order in Paris and coordinated with other cities to build a delegation of communes. It was only after the Jacquerie threatened to blockade Paris that Marcel allied with them. In an attempt to shore up defence of the city, he invited King Charles the Bad of Navarre to be Captain General of Paris. This did not work out, however, as Charles invited English troops to occupy Paris. After rioting, the English were forced to flee. Marcel was killed in street fighting during riots over fear the English would return, and his attempts to establish an independent Paris failed. With just a cursory glance at both of these rebellions, the drivers are similar. They are a response to harsh financial burdens and an attempt to protect trade. The Flemish response is also retaliatory in nature and political, while the Paris uprising is also an attempt to stabilise the capital and its currency. Once successful, the revolutionaries attempted to establish governments. Neither set about initially to create a new government from the onset. Finally, both of these revolutions failed at the death of their leaders, which is often very common, leading to a counter-revolution by the ruling elites. Harsh punishments, execution of leaders, and other reprisals are carried out to ensure no further trouble. In the case of the Flemish revolts, this only leads to a spiral of revolution and counter-revolution. 
It is often hard to get a clear picture of the people involved in the rebellions as the characterization of the rebels and their causes are depicted with hostility by chroniclers of the period. Medieval chronicles were not history books as we would see them today. They were written expressly for an audience of elites. The rebels of these accounts are spoken of in negative terms. They're evildoers, they are lawless, vulgar, and cruel. The common man is infantilized. To the elites, the protests and rebellions were not just wars, but the upsetting of the natural order, of which they were the natural rulers. They were placed there by God and the rebels were like animals or children who had to be put into their places. The revolutions destabilized Europe. The aristocracy, church and patrician elites did little to nothing to address the structural issues impacting society. Viewed separately, each of these events would not appear to be connected. However, we can have the benefit of time to review how these things are interconnected. These revolutions would continue to plague Europe for centuries. The stability of the High Middle Ages had been broken. The 14th century revolutions gave way to more coherent worker-led proletariat revolution, such as the Hussite Wars and the German Peasant Revolts. However, these wars and others like it failed to address the issues of poverty and inequality in Europe leading into the early modern and modern periods. Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. Means you must have enjoyed the video. So like, comment and subscribe. And remember, stay safe, have fun, and keep reenacting.